Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Abby Loeb is the Frank Baird Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University, Chairman of Harvard's Department of Astronomy, Founding Director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative, and Director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, as well as Chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies. He's the author of four books, over 700 scientific papers. In 2012, Time Magazine selected Abby Loeb as one of the 25 most influential people in space. I can tell you he's a man of courage and integrity whose new book, Interstellar, is a must-read for anyone interested in the UFO UAP mystery. Dr. Loeb, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. You know, since you jumped into this topic uh, some years ago, have you had a moment where you ever had to ask yourself, gosh, was this a good idea? Maybe I made the wrong decision. No, I don't think so. And the other way around, the, the more I go uh, into it, the, the better it looks in the sense of, um, you know, you have people on both sides uh, that are not interested in collecting evidence. Uh, they include the believers who just say they believe in it. Uh, and the uh, skeptics, um, some of my colleagues in academia, who are very negative, uh, they ridicule the subject, but at the same time, they're not uh, willing to invest any time in, in searching for the evidence. So um, what I discovered is that um, uh, common sense is not common. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I established uh, the Galileo Project at Harvard University. We have an observatory that is operating 24-7, uh, collecting data. Uh, we are now testing uh, all the components of it. Um, the data goes to our computer system and then uh, analyzed by machine learning uh, software. Now, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I um, heard the Bill Nelson at NASA uh, talk about the subject after the director of national intelligence uh, delivered the report to Congress. And Bill said that uh, as a senator, he saw some classified data and the hair in the back of his neck stood up. And so uh, he believes that scientists should get engaged. So the following morning, uh, I sent an email to the person under him responsible for science, uh, Thomas uh, Zurbuchen. And within uh, half an hour, he called me back and asked me to send uh, a white paper. I sent a white paper suggesting more research. I said, I'm happy to make your boss uh, um, happy. And uh, I never heard back from them. And as a result, I established the Galileo Project that is doing exactly that. As you can tell from the way the study was conducted, first of all, you know, they ended up recommending what we are already doing. Uh, maybe the good thing is that they acknowledge the need uh, to do scientific research on unidentified anomalous phenomena. But at the end, they appointed the director uh, who, you know, has no scientific credentials. Uh, this is a person who... Is just was just a liaison to the Department of Defense. So we're back to square one. Um, instead of uh, investing funds in the in the in more uh, research on this, uh, they went in a bureaucratic uh, direction of basically allowing the Pentagon to lead the way. Um, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office that was established there as a result of the report from the department from the Director of National Intelligence. So. Um, if you wait for the government to do the right thing, uh, you, you might wait forever. I mean, they, they have uh, perhaps classified data that is quite intriguing, but they will not release it because it was collected by classified sensors. So I decided to take uh, uh, this uh, to, to our hands. And, um, you know, the sky is not classified, the oceans are not classified, and the Galileo Project is just studying it the scientific way. And, of course, the negative is uh, that uh, 
lots of people in academia push back, ridicule it. Not only that they are not engaged, so you might say, okay, well, don't engage, but, but why uh, um, ridicule it? I mean, that, that sounds to me like a counter to the scientific method. Uh, we are all trying to understand, you know, if there are anomalies, let's figure them out. What's the problem of just using instruments to figure it out? Those people who are ridiculing or uh, expressing negative sentiments, they're not doing anything. I mean, they're taking the easy route and just saying bad things about it. Uh, and uh, to me, that sounds uh, counter-scientific. So I, I, to answer your question, I don't regret it for a minute. It may take some time. Um, if the government has uh, uh, data that they would declassify, of course, uh, uh, that would help the case. But irrespective, uh, I'm doing my work, and uh, we just came back from the Pacific Ocean uh, a few months ago, and I um, uh, released the findings um, a few weeks ago. And if you want, we can discuss them as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's definitely. Actually, it, it's quite uh, a thrill to go in a path that was not taken. You know, there is this uh, poem by Robert Frost uh, of taking the, the road not taken. And, uh, of course, it, it makes all the difference because you are discovering new things. Um, but there is also uh, the chance that there is some low-hanging fruit because nobody took this path. I mean, yes. the SETI community was looking for radio signals for 70 years, and they are one of the most vocal opponents to the kind of research I'm doing. They're trying, they're calling me names and they're trying to push back. And I just don't understand it because they are after searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. Why would they oppose to searching for objects in our backyard? Like that is a different method than red. I mean, listening for radio signals is, is just like waiting for a phone call. It's a completely <laughs> different approach than uh, going out to the backyard and checking your mailbox if there are any packages. And uh, yet, they are not, I mean, you wouldn't believe it, they organize talks against uh, the kind of work I'm doing. They, they don't allow um, any discussion of this topic in their conferences. And once again, it, 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 this looks completely unnatural to me. It, it's completely uh, opposed to what we all think scientists, science should be and what scientists could do. I really enjoy uh, following along as you take them on, the people who try to ridicule this, not only do they not want to investigate it themselves, they don't want you investigating it either, which is completely contrary to what you think the mission of science could be. I don't understand why they're just not curious. How can you, you don't have to base your whole career on it if they, if they don't like it, but how can they not be curious about the biggest questions of human existence? Yes. Uh, in fact, um, in two weeks, um, uh, the, there will be a play uh, presented uh, that was written by playwright Josh Rovetch uh, about my research. And the hope is that within a year it will show in New York City off Broadway. Uh, and one of the lines in the play, I was just uh, in the rehearsal uh, yesterday, uh, one of the lines says, uh, why is childlike bullying so much more prevalent than childlike curiosity you know that is the fundamental question uh i mean people enjoy bullying much more than being curious and you would expect scientists to be exactly the opposite because the whole point about science is to discover new knowledge and how can you find new knowledge if you are always uh, attached to past knowledge which is pretty much what they are doing you know if there are anomalies, things that we don't understand, we better figure them out. You know, what, what is the worst thing that can happen? That we will find that, okay, these objects in the sky are just balloons and drones and, and, and airplanes or things that manu are manufactured by the Chinese or the Russians. Okay, so in that case, you know, the intelligence agencies will, will benefit knowing that. But it's not a bad thing for scientists to help you know, the, the government or national security, it's actually a, a positive thing. And I, I don't really, I'm not interested in anything made in China at all. To me, it's boring. Uh, I would deliver this data to whoever wants it in Washington, D.C. And if we see birds, you know, there are zoologists interested in them. So I'm happy to deliver them the data. 
I don't see any any cost uh, in terms of um, uh, you know the results that we might obtain. Uh, and if we find one out of a thousand objects to be of extraterrestrial origin, of course that would be a huge discovery of great importance to the future of humanity. So what's the problem if in, in in looking? Um, and um, you know, I think uh, it's it's really unfortunate that um, currently in academia the situation is like that. And I I don't uh, understand what happened to Bill Nelson. He was a former astronaut, a U.S. senator, as you said. He made some dramatic statements after having these briefings behind closed doors, and then he made him as director of NASA, thinking, "Hey, NASA is the right place to do this." We're going to get to the bottom of this. And then he, he, he flipped the switch or something last week saying, ah, well, most of this is explainable. It's not a big deal. You know, we're dealing with a lot of UFO kooks and really walked it back. And then NASA makes this announcement. All right, we're going to we're going to have nothing but transparency. And then they won't even tell us the name of the guy who's heading their new program. It was crazy. Do you uh, did you were you surprised by the change in attitude we won't dwell on NASA too long, but were you surprised by the apparent change of attitude based on what uh, uh, Bill Nelson and others at NASA have said in the past? Well, I think um, it, it looks as if um, they connected with Aero, the Oil Domain Anomaly Resolution Office in the Pentagon. And um, as a result, uh, they basically represent uh, the scientific uh, a branch of um, whatever Aero is doing, um, if they have data of interest, they deliver it to Aero. And um, it, it looks as if they see it from a national security perspective, not from a scientific perspective. So they just want um, uh, basically to check if there is um, espionage. Um, I mean, the balloon, the, the Chinese-made balloon that was shut down is an example. And um, Sean Kirkpatrick, the director of Aero, said that um, uh, only a few percent of the objects they look at might, uh, are not fully understood. So, you know, it's possible that Aero came to the realization that 97 percent of the objects are human-made. Therefore, it's a matter of national security. You know, that's a reasonable decision for a government employee to make. You know, if 97 percent of the objects are human-made and some are not uh, made in the U.S., you just want your hands on 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 these, and uh, to make sure that you protect the nation. Uh, and then NASA is used as a tool to collect more data because they have access to satellites and other uh, instruments that collect data all the time. So, um, so as a result, uh, the two the two organizations spoke and said, that, "Okay, it's a matter of national security. We we want to deal with it that way." And, of course, that's not driven by curiosity about extraterrestrial objects visiting us, uh, which is the scientific approach to consider it. Um, and so they, I think they basically are completely tilted in that direction. Now, of course, in the process of looking at objects, they might see something unusual. But if they're interested in national security and has nothing to do with uh, adversaries, they will just leave it off the table. Um, I, on the other hand, I'm exactly op- uh, interested in the opposite. <laughs> Even if one object in a thousand is uh, very strange, I want to know about it because uh, we're talking about something that will inform us about uh, neighbors in our cosmic uh, environment. And that's, of course, of great scientific significance. So I think, w- <laughs> once again, we cannot rely on the government to be transparent, to follow curiosity. Um, they, you know, it's, um, the, taking the matter to our own hands is, is the right approach. And um, it may well be that uh, uh, the expedition to the Pacific Ocean, uh, you know, going to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean allows us to learn more on about interstellar space than uh, waiting for politicians in Washington, D.C. to tell us. So this is the approach I'm taking, you know, using uh, cameras, using uh, uh, microphones, using um, uh, right. passive radar system. And um, uh, John Mack was just speaking with people. Now, that, of course, is somewhat subjective. And uh, as a result, the university uh, argued that, you know, it's uh, just people 
telling him stories and right. uh, that reduces the credibility of the institution or something like that. I'll tell he you might- what, Dr. Loeb, I'll inter- interject here in a moment. We're talking with Dr. Avi Loeb. Uh, we're going to get into his new book, Interstellar, which asks the question, what happens on day two after it, an extraterrestrial civilization uh, may have been confirmed? You know, the last time we had a chance to speak with Dr. Avi Loeb, the topic was Oumuamua, this cigar-shaped object way, way out there that was first confirmed uh, interstellar visitor. It it wasn't just a rock, Dr. Loeb contended. Uh, It's an artifact from an ET civilization. That astonishing declaration kicked off an intense debate that continues to this day, and it also ignited tremendous interest uh, among the general public. Dr. Loeb's new book, Interstellar, expands the conversation. He makes the argument that investigating, learning about possible ET civilizations is essential to human survival. We're going to get into that part of the discussion next. Dr. Loeb, I have to tell you what I'm most excited about your new book, Interstellar, is that it is so hopeful. It's positive. There's a sense of excitement in this book. It's uh, like a message Let's go learn about this. Let's dig into it. Let's find out our true place in the cosmos, our position in the universal pecking order. You know, find out, are we alone? Do you set out to purposely make it kind of a hopeful, positive message? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I learned about life is that it's often a self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, it's better to be an optimist. Uh, If I would think that uh, I will not find anything uh, in the Pacific Ocean, I would not go there and I wouldn't find anything. So um, it's much better to uh, be positive uh, because every now and then uh, your wishes come true. (laughs) And, um, uh, you know, there is a a book, a famous book by Steven Weinberg, uh, the physicist who who won uh, the Nobel Prize, called The First Three Minutes. And towards the end of it, he says, the more uh, we comprehend the universe, uh, the more pointless it seems. And that's a depressing thought. The universe is pointless. And I thought about it, and I realized that he's completely wrong. The reason he finds the universe pointless, and by the way, it's not only him, but it's all the my colleagues that work on studying the universe, um, is because they focus on lifeless objects, you know, elementary particles, radiation, things that have no life. And we know from uh, our own life that uh, finding a partner uh, brings a meaning to your life. And loneliness is pointless. And um, so my (laughs) advice is let's search for a partner out there, for a neighbor, because that will change our perspective. Suddenly the universe would appear to be um, meaningful. And... uh, You know, that is a very basic uh, perspective that uh, could change the future of humanity, because if we find uh, a partner, a a neighbor that is more accomplished than we are, we could learn something new um, that we haven't yet learned uh, in in the last uh, century of science and technology. Uh, They could inspire us to go into space. And at the very least, I, I can imagine that You know, it would convince us that what we are doing now makes no sense. I mean, we are engaged in conflicts. Two trillion dollars a year is going to military budgets worldwide. And just, you know, think about using this money for uh, space exploration. I calculated that we could reach uh, every star in the Milky Way galaxy uh, by sending probes um, Within one century, billions of probes with this budget in one century will go towards every star. Um, So it's just a matter of priorities. And um, uh, perhaps if we realize that we have a neighbor out there and uh, they reached our doorstep before we reached their doorstep, you know, that would convince us to work together because we are all in the same boat, uh, Earth, sailing through space. And when I was in the Pacific Ocean, I realized, you know, all the team members were working together selflessly uh, towards the success of the mission. That's the kind of uh, uh, attitude that I'm really hoping for. If, you know, there would be this wake-up call coming from 
a neighbor that will change the priorities of humanity, make us all work together as equal members of the human species. This expedition you made out into the Pacific sounds like a, just a rollicking grand adventure. Could you share with our audience why you picked that spot, what you were looking for, and what you found? Yeah, so the story starts uh, on January 8th, uh, 2014, when U.S. government satellites uh, uh, detected a fireball from the collision of an object with Earth. And that's called a meteor, when an object collides with Earth and burns up in the atmosphere as a result of friction with air. Uh, what was unusual about this one is that the object was moving very fast. Um, it, co- it actually came from behind the Earth in its orbit around the sun. And even though it came from behind the Earth, it was moving at 45 kilometers per second, faster than Earth, uh, relative to Earth itself. Um, and uh, we calculated uh, in 2019, January 2019, when that was exactly five years after this object was uh, found by the U.S. government, it was just put in a catalog of NASA. And uh, I was uh, interviewed about uh, another meteor that uh, landed uh, near Kamchatka, um, and uh, it's called the Kamchatka Meteor, just a couple of weeks earlier. Uh, so the radio interviewer wanted to ask questions about that, and I looked at the uh, online and found this catalog of NASA. And I asked my student uh, to check if any of the objects, the fastest objects, might have originated from outside the solar system, because I was already intrigued by Oumuamua that looked uh, unlike any rock that we are familiar with in the solar system. And so I said, why don't we find if there is any meteor? that came from outside the solar system, and we found this one. And then uh, sent, uh, submitted the paper for publication, and the referees, my colleagues, uh, rejected it. They said, we don't believe the U.S. government. So uh, at the time, I was chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies, and I complained about it to my colleagues there. I said, uh, look, I mean, this is data that You know, the U.S. Space Command is uh, getting more funding than NASA, and we should trust uh, their, uh, you know, their data because, uh, you know, they are supposed to alert the U.S. president if a ballistic missile is coming from North Korea. And if they make mistakes, uh, they will say, no, it's going to Mexico while it's heading towards Washington. So it's, you know, they know what they're talking about. Anyway, so um, as a result of me frustrated, uh, one of the people with, behind the national security fence suggested to help. And it ended up with a person from the White House reaching to um, uh, the U.S. Space Command. And there was a letter issued uh, by the U.S. Space Command in March 2022, three years later, um, saying that they confirm, after looking at the data again, they confirm that it's uh, of interstellar origin. This huh. meteor came from outside the solar system. And they do it at the 99.99% confidence. That was a letter sent to NASA. Uh, the, U- the Department of Defense basically came to my defense on this matter, and our paper was accepted for publication at that point. And the government also released the data about the fireball, the light curve uh, from this uh, meteor. And that allowed us to conclude two things. Well, first of all, it came with a very high speed already outside the solar system, uh, faster than 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun relative to the local frame of the Milky Way galaxy. So that's unusual, uh, faster than 95% of the stars near the sun. And moreover, it exploded only in the lower atmosphere where the stress on the object was far greater than uh, on all other space rocks that we had seen as meteors. 272 of them uh, in the NASA catalog over the past decade. Um, So the object was unusually tough, uh, material strength larger than even iron meteorites, uh, which make up 5% of the meteors. So, um, um, you know, that raised the possibility that it may be a Voyager-like meteor. Just imagine our own spacecraft, Voyager, going to interstellar space and eventually colliding with a planet like the Earth. Uh, It would appear as a meteor in the sky of that planet, 
uh, that is of unusual material strength because it's made of stainless steel and unusual speed because it was propelled by a rocket. And so I decided to go to the site of the meteor and find uh, what it was made of. And uh, that was a big challenge. You know, there were many failure points. Uh, first, we had to get one and a half million dollars uh, to fund the expedition. And gladly, uh, Charles Hoskinson, uh, the funder, uh, contacted me out of the blue. And uh, we had a Zoom call and he said, you have the money. And then uh, organizing a team of uh, 28 people, the best in the world, by the way, and that was, again, a very fortunate uh, circumstance that those people agreed and joined, and actually many of them volunteered to join us. Uh, and then we built a sled with magnets uh, on both sides and that is one meter wide and 200 kilograms in mass, and we placed it on the ocean floor connected with a cable to the ship uh, that was fittingly called the Silver Star. And we basically dragged the sled back and forth, just like mowing the lawn, uh, across a region that is uh, seven miles in size. And the ocean is more than a mile deep. And what we were looking for are the molten droplets from the surface of the object when it was exposed to the fireball, the immense heat that surrounded it. And uh, those droplets were supposed to be a millimeter or, or less in size. That's the size of a grain of sand. So just think about it, searching for <laughs> grains of sand at the bottom of the ocean, a mile deep, across a region of seven <laughs> miles in, oh, in length. And um, so many, many of my colleagues obviously said, you will find nothing, it's a waste of time, waste. And I said, you know, why don't you sit back and relax? I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm doing the heavy lifting. Uh, and uh, if I come back with nothing, you can say that's what I expected. So we went there. And uh, after six days, I mean, at first the sled was not uh, lying on the ocean floor because the cable was lifting it. Uh, it was kiting. Um, and uh, uh, the exceptional engineers um, that we had, on the ship re realized that we need to go with a current in order to keep it on the floor. But then we started collecting materials and most of it was volcanic ash. This is black powder uh, from volcanic activity. Um, and then um, after the sixth day, I mean, I wrote 43 diary reports altogether. And uh, after the sixth day, I wrote uh, uh, an essay on medium.com. All of them were published by the way. And there were a few millions uh, millions of people around the world who read those reports. They were very excited. Um, and um, they were translated to Spanish. And on the sixth day, I wrote uh, a report with the title, Where are the spherules? Uh, these are the molten droplets. We didn't find them yet. And uh, I was straightforward. We didn't find them. Um, and then... Um, the following day, we started filtering the black powder, the particles that are small. We let them out with a mesh uh, that had the size of a quarter of a millimeter. And then we started looking at the big particles through a microscope. And lo and behold, we found a spiral. Uh, it it oh, looked man. very distinct from the background sand. It, it was like a metallic marble. And uh, I basically hugged the person who found it first on the microscope. And I was so thrilled because I knew that if you find an ant in the kitchen, there must be many more out there. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, we found uh, 50 of them during the expedition that lasted two weeks uh, between June 14th to 28th, uh, 2023. And uh, when we came back... Um, to Harvard, I shipped the materials by FedEx. Uh, it arrived a few days later to my home. Uh, I realized that a few days of a delay is not a big deal because this material took billions of years to arrive to us uh, from far away. Um, and then I brought it to a laboratory of Stein Jacobson at Harvard that has the best uh, uh, mass spectrometer in the world um, to analyze the composition of the spherules. And 
um, we found that there is an excess of spheroids along the meteor path. Uh, we made a map, uh, my postdoc, uh, uh, Laura Domini, uh, made that map, and, and we saw the concentration of extra excess of uh, spheroids uh, along the path. And, of course, there were some background spheroids in in the control regions and also in the area of the meteor. But but on top of that, there was an excess. And and then we found a special type of spherules that were along the meteor path in those uh, regions of excess. Uh, and that the composition of that was never seen before um, in the scientific literature. Uh, it's uh, materials that have a very different um, abundance of elements than um, in the solar system. Uh, you know, elements like lanthanum, uranium, beryllium are hundreds of times more abundant in those spheroids. And, and that was never seen uh, anywhere. And so we reported the results, the findings. And um, now, I mean, so far we analyzed only about uh, a tenth of the spheroids we had. When we came back to Harvard, my summer intern found uh, uh, 600 more <laughs> in addition to the 50 we had on the ship. And so altogether, we have about 700 right now. So we analyzed 57, and we are now in the process of analyzing many more. And um, it, it's just um, you know an amazing uh, story of discovery, taking risks despite all odds and, and being successful. And, you know, there were so many points of failure that uh, every team member was essential for the success of this mission. And um, we will go again because uh, for now we can just say it came from outside the solar system, but to be able to tell if it's um, uh, natural, if, it's, uh, if it was a rock that came from an unusual environment different than the solar system, or it was uh, a technological oh, gadget, uh, maybe... What? We found the element of semiconductors there. We need oh my to find gosh. bigger pieces. <laughs> well, and it's we, such we a are... great, it's such a great scientific adventure story. I mean, it's something worthy of Jules Verne. It should be a movie. I, I hope you had cameras along the way, Doctor Loeb. We know what happens on our planet when a more advanced civilization discovers a less advanced uh, people. You know, the the less advanced one gets absorbed or destroyed or decimated. It's happened again and again on various continents. What happens if your spherules, sphere, the, the little bits and pieces that you discovered out there on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, that you can confirm that they are, in fact, technological artifacts, not just natural elements? What happens the day after that? How does our world react? Well, um, I think most people just go by their day. They don't, um, I mean, you can see it um, in the film, uh, uh, Don't Look Up. I mean, um, it will take time to convince people to change their life <laughs> based on this realization. But, uh, you know, we went through that already. We uh, thought that the universe centers on us, and then uh, Copernicus and Galileo realized, no, we are, the Earth is actually moving around the sun. We are not the center. That was uh, a big change for people to accept, and uh, we got used to it. And now uh, we are able to reach Mars. Thanks to this, uh, if we thought that Mars moves around the Earth, we would never get there with our rocket. So it takes time for people to adapt, but um, ultimately it's good for us to know that if we have neighbors, uh, th that we do. Um, and, of course, in the case of this expedition, it's not um, so much the composition of those um, spherules, but we are planning to go again and look for bigger pieces. And if we find the an object with buttons on it, it's obviously a technological gadget. And then the question would be, should we press the button? Um, and I asked the students in my class at Harvard, half of them said, uh, no, please don't press any button. It would affect <laughs> all of us. And the other half said, uh, please do. We would like to see what happens. Uh, and then one of the students uh, said, uh, uh, Professor, La, what would you actually do given this uh, uh, conflicting views, and uh, I said I will take it to a laboratory and examine it before engaging with it. Um, but you are asking me how how will people respond? I don't. First of all, I don't worry about um, 
um, any warnings that uh, even Stephen Hawking uh, expressed that he said, uh, you know, it would be dangerous for for us to reveal our existence or to communicate with anything extraterrestrial. I'm, I don't think about it this way because to me the encounter would would be more like um, a colony of ants on the pavement uh, looking at the biker that is passing by. I mean, the biker doesn't have any any agenda with respect to the ants. Um, uh, in fact, if there is a visitor from far away, uh, you know, it, it, the journey must have taken millions to billions of years. Uh, and um, humans did not exist on Earth if, uh, more than a few million years ago. So... Um, they didn't have us in mind, and uh, we are not a threat at this point in time uh, because their technologies are probably much more sophisticated than ours. So it, it's actually an opportunity for us to learn uh, about future technologies uh, more than for them to engage in any conflict. Um, and I see it as um, uh, you know as, as something that is beneficial for us and. Uh, I, you know, we should be curious to figure out uh, what they know uh, and what kind of science and technology they may have. And I don't see it as dangerous at all. Uh, but indeed, most people would just go, uh, you know, ignore it perhaps at first. But it doesn't really matter. You don't need the approval of other people. Once uh, we figure out this thing, you know, the it will capture the imagination of. Um, young people and you know we will make more and more progress as time goes on in finding out what you know what these neighbors know and what they were seeking and so forth and here i'm talking just about space trash you know the, these are uh, objects that are floating in space and colliding with earth by chance and just like plastics in the ocean they accumulated over time in space and uh, we just find them but there is also the other type which is um, uh, functional devices, you know, that could be the unidentified anomalous phenomena. These are objects that are doing something. And, of course, dealing with them might be more complicated because, you know, we, we have to figure out what they are looking for, what they are doing. And uh, it's just like having a visitor in your backyard. It makes no sense to have a protocol to say, if the visitor is this type, that's what I'll do. If it's a different type, that, because our imagination is limited by our experience. And uh, this could be well beyond what we imagine. You know, it, it would look like a miracle to us, many of the things that are happening, because, because uh, it's just like uh, the experience of a cave dweller coming to New York City for, for the first time. All the gadgets would look like miracles and sort of like a religious experience in a way. Uh, you know, Moses looked at the burning bush, and that convinced him that God exists. But uh, think of the burning bush as uh, some gadget uh, from another civilization doing things that uh, Moses did not expect. Um, in fact, a very advanced uh, scientific civilization is a good approximation to God. You know, like uh, it will do things that we cannot imagine. And um, if I had the Galileo project uh, uh, cameras, you know, next to Moses, uh, I would inform Moses of what uh, temperature this bush has and what en how much energy per unit time is emitted from it. And I could tell Moses if this is a natural bush or, or something from a higher, uh, a superhuman uh, entity. Um, and, uh, you know, being informed about that, Moses would have a better uh, idea whether to believe in a superhuman entity. You know, the Galileo Project, as you point out, does not need to wait on government. You're proceeding uh, and using the resources that are available. You think that we can answer some of these questions without necessarily traveling to some extrasolar planet, that we can find out quite a bit here, as you did with that expedition out into the ocean. Uh, but you have to be curious what evidence exists in government files and vaults. We've all heard the testimony uh, without necessarily embracing some of the things that have been claimed about bodies and and uh, craft stashed in government hangars, you must be curious whether or not the answers to some of your questions are already in the hands of government employees, right? Yeah, I'm very curious. The problem is that even David Grush uh, did not witness the evidence. He just heard 40 people talk about it and uh, mention these programs. 
that the, the government has. And uh, obviously, the different parts of government do not know about each other. Um, so the question is whether Congress will be able to get to the bottom of this by contacting the people that Grush spoke with um, and uh, eventually expose those materials. I'm worried that even if they exist and, and these materials are in the possession of some uh, you know, uh, corporations, for example, that um, hearing about um, what is happening in Congress, uh, these corporations will move the materials somewhere else or somehow the, the evidence will disappear. It's not clear to me that we will get to the bottom of it, but now there is a chance that some Congress people will, will dig deeper. And the, there is also the, uh, the new legislation that is being proposed to establish uh, a, a department uh, of nine people that would uh, actually look into all the classified information within government and release some of it. So, you know, I'm... Uh, I, I hope that if such evidence exists, we will get to see it. I would love to see it as a scientist to help the government figure it out, because if it's interstellar, you know, they are not a scientific organization. They will no. never get to the bottom of it. No. Uh, and if it's interstellar, it has nothing to do with uh, national security, because from far away, the way we split the, the land on this rock, the Earth, is completely irrelevant. They don't, the senders of, of whatever the government found uh, do not care about national borders. And uh, it's completely inappropriate for the government to hold this uh, secret. If they do, uh, it should be information shared by all humans the way science is done. You make the point in, in your book, Interstellar, that really figuring this out is essential to human survival. We may not know what's going to happen in 10 years or even 100 years, but we do know what's going to happen if we don't blow ourselves up or poison our planet further down the road, we're going to need to get out of here, right? Exactly. Um, because uh, irrespective of what we do, the sun has its own uh, timeline. <laughs> so within a billion years, which is roughly 20% of the age of the Earth, so we have only 20% left. Within a billion years, the sun will boil off all oceans on Earth and will not allow for life as we know it to continue. Um, and uh, that happened to Mars. You know, the, all the oceans were boiled off because Mars uh, lost its atmosphere and became a desert that we see today. The Earth will become just like that um, within a billion years. And uh, a billion years is a long time, but we need to start planning because there are other catastrophes that may show up. Uh, you know, the Earth went through episodes of uh, warming and cooling. It, it, uh, uh, at some point, it was uh, an iceberg. So um, we shouldn't take it for granted that the conditions we have right now will, will continue. And um, we should start ex exploring space. And, you know, if we, for example, build a, a space station that um, has everything we need uh, has, uh, uh, and we can tune its distance from the sun, then we can be always at the right distance from the furnace irrespective of how hot the furnace gets. Um, and so I think our future is definitely out there. And um, you know, it, it will be good to make copies of whatever we find precious here on Earth and place them in various locations so that if one copy gets damaged, it's not the end of the world. There are other copies out there. This, this was the approach of the Gutenberg printing press. Uh, when they made copies of the Bible, you know, it was previously handwritten and every copy was extremely precious. But once uh, the printing press came along, you know, it's not so bad if one copy gets lost and um, others are out there and the content is not lost. You, you look at the pace of technological change five years, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, how much we have now that we didn't have then. You speculate in in the book, you explore the idea that Good gosh, there are star systems way, way older than ours out there. It is possible that there's a civilization that's not only 10,000 years, but maybe 100,000, a million, many millions of years older. And to us, they would essentially be gods. Uh, but, but maybe they have sent things like planting little Easter eggs, something like Oumuamua that's sitting out there 
waiting for us to get advanced enough to figure out what the heck it is, that it's, in essence, a calling card, right? Yeah. I mean, we haven't really developed uh, away from uh, the animal kingdom on Earth uh, until very recently. And, you know, we uh, came out of the chimpanzees uh, a few million years ago, mainly because we developed a language. Uh, we were able to, uh, you know, evolve to where we are right now. And uh, the next step, <laughs> big phase transition, is happening now when we have these large language models uh, of artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and the, the next generation of those, uh, within the coming year probably, uh, will have more connections than the number of synapses in the human brain. So once again, language, these large language model, models are becoming smarter than humans. And first of all, this tells us, you know, we are not the pinnacle of creation. There is something better than us that could come along the way in terms of intelligence. We, we tend to think, you know, most uh, scientists argue that thinking that there are extraterrestrials out there is an extraordinary claim because we are the smartest here on Earth. Well, first of all, this is now about to be disputed by AI systems. Uh, it's sort of like an alien that we created, um, an alien intelligence. But beyond that, you know, most stars from billions of years before the sun, there are, you know, billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone and tens of billions of galaxies like the Milky Way uh, in the observable volume of the universe. And to think that Albert Einstein was the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang, you know, that's a crazy proposition. I would argue, you know, that it's actually extraordinary to think that we are alone given these circumstances. <laughs> And it's very arrogant to think that way. But, but my colleagues also say, oh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I say, evidence doesn't fall into our lap. We need to search for it. And extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. <laughs> so you can see that throughout science, that huge amounts of money, billions of dollars were poured into uh, questions to which we have no answer. And even after that, we didn't get a, 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 an answer. And the, the recent example is the Large Hadron Collider was looking for dark matter particles, didn't find them. Uh, supersymmetry, didn't find it. Just confirmed the Higgs boson, which was already sort of very much uh, uh, believed in. Um, and so um, that's the way science is done. You, you have to invest in the search. And, you know, the Galileo project that I'm leading uh, you know, we had some funding from donations to start with, but we need more funding to build more observatories to look for UAP, unidentified anomalous phenomena. And so, um, you know, we are the only scientific project that is engaged in right. this question. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about funding and how maybe the public could help you uh, down that road. You know, it's uh, as a species, we are explorers by nature. It's inevitable if we don't blow ourselves up that we'll get out there someday. And might a, an older, more advanced civilization have sent uh, probes our way to, to check us out? As, as Dr. Loeb notes in his book, Interstellar, uh, we earthlings have sent five vehicles, uh, craft, out bound for interstellar regions beyond our solar system. Um, and someday, maybe millions of years from now, some other advanced civilization might find them. Uh, hopefully we'll still be here to make contact with them if they track it back to the source. Uh, I'm curious uh, in our final segment tonight uh, how hopeful Dr. Loeb is for the future, whether his students, his young students at, at Harvard, are more curious uh, about the nature of the universe, about our, our place in the pecking order, uh, universal intelligence, whether they're more curious about it than the stodgy, universe, uh, stodgy generation of mine. Uh, we're going to get into that, take a call or two from our listeners in our final segment of Coast to Coast AM. Dr. Loeb, there's a semi-famous quote about uh, science. It goes that science advances one funeral at a time, sort of a, a, a cruel way of looking at how stodgy science can be, how generations don't, don't want to give up on 
what they uh, accept as as fact. I'm curious about your students at Harvard, a great university. Now that they know what you're doing, the kind of work that you're doing, are they excited? Uh, are they more open to these possibilities than, say, people of our generation? Yeah, fundamentally they are. <laughs> the only problem is when they see the kind of uh, bullying or ridiculing coming from uh, senior people um, and uh, just pushing back uh, against any deviation from the beaten path. Uh, I mean, they worry about their job prospects and uh, they do a calculation whether they should get engaged in such research or maybe just uh, dance to the tunes of those uh, selection committees uh, that are populated by uh, those mainstream uh, scientists. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. That's the biggest damage that uh, I can see. You know, by now, uh, my skin turned into titanium. I, I, <laughs> they cannot do anything to me. Um, and who are they? You know, many of the people who criticize are bloggers um, who and, and science popularizers uh, who don't have even a single paper written, scientific paper, over the past decade. You know, they, it includes uh, some we- very well-known people, including uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He didn't, he didn't write a paper in, in the past decade and a half, yet he calls himself a scientist, a, an astrophysicist, but he's not practicing science. And so when these uh, uh, people criticize uh, the subject or me, what I'm doing, you know, it's just like um, commentators looking at a soccer match and telling the players how to pass the ball. Uh, who are they to tell me how to do science? I'm actually writing scientific papers. I'm doing the work of science. I'm also conversing with the public while I'm doing that. But that's not a negative. I, I, want, I don't feel superior to the public. I feel that I should inform the public in what's going on. And so, um, uh, you know, so that is the most negative thing that my, you know, young people see that and they get worried, um, politically speaking. But um, um, I have uh, some postdocs, three postdocs within the Galileo project that told me that, uh, you know, they always wanted to work on this subject. And until uh, uh, the project was established, they had no opportunity to do that. That was their dream. And so when I offered them a fellowship, they, you know, they, they were thrilled um, and they are working on it now and are very happy. So these are people that are a bit more mature. You know, they, they don't just listen to others. And they were fascinated by this subject and they wanted to pursue scientific research of unidentified anomalous phenomena. And, of course, on, on, in the context of the expedition, you know, I have a, a lot of young people that are curious and, and might work on it. It's a, it's a challenging situation where you get attacked from both sides, you know, from people that are uh, just skeptical and don't want to collect evidence and people that believe in it and also don't want to collect evidence because they don't want their belief to be shaken. Um, and then I'm just trying to do, you know, the most sensible thing, which is let's be guided by the evidence. In your book, you write about Senator Harry Reid, uh, that he was introduced to this topic by a friend of his and that opened his uh, mind and expanded his horizons, and, and he became a champion of funding that uh, that really established a really great program and, and really is responsible for all that's unfolding now in the government sector. I am the friend who introduced him to that topic, and and as you note in, in your book, he was he did not have a science education. He was not uh, brilliant in that sense, but he was uh, smart and curious, and he really embraced uh, the subject matter. We, we hope that there are other political leaders with the courage to do that now, because as you note, you need some funding for this. Right. I mean, Chuck Schumer actually mentioned uh, Harry Reid in a recent statement uh, uh, when the defense bill was uh, discussed. And, right. Uh, he obviously uh, many people are inspired by what Harry did. Um, so yes, we do need funding. And by the way, the funding is not um, at a very high level. I mean, uh, big science projects like the Webb Telescope or the Large Hadron Collider, they consumed ten billion dollars. What we need in order to get to the bottom of unidentified aerial phenomena, is funding at a level of tens of millions of dollars. So that's just, a, um, you know, it's uh, less than a, a few percent of that 
uh, it's a percent or so of the total uh, that is invested in big science projects. So it's really small compared to the biggest uh, investments that we have in science. But um, at the moment, we uh, I received only a few million dollars, which we are almost about to exhaust right now uh, this year. Um, and so w- what we need is something at the level of uh, what Harry Reid was able to raise, uh, tens of millions of dollars. That could bring us very close to, you know, what we... Uh, what we aim at, which which is to build the tens of observatories around the country that look at the sky 24/7, collect data, and analyze it. And um, we we don't need to wait for the government to declassify data. With this uh, level of funding, we can find the answer and let the public know about it. And um, you know, it's within our reach. I imagine it'd be risky to accept government money. Uh, you'd have to worry about strings attached, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, I would much rather have uh, private donations. Uh, and um, um, we have on the Galileo website uh, uh, a button that says uh, support us. Um, it could be crowdfunding. Uh, it could also be uh, someone that is inspired by, by this uh, study and would like to promote it and you know, we we know exactly what needs to be done because we built uh, an observatory that is functioning right now. We just need to make enough copies of it uh, so that we get uh, good statistics, a lot of uh, data, and and the data will be open to the public and people could look at it and uh, whatever we find, we let uh, everyone know. Uh, we'll take a call from Brendan in Austin, Texas. Good morning, Brendan. You're on with Dr. Abby Loeb. Thank you, George Knapp and Dr. Avi Loeb. It's a huge pleasure. I will be quick because everybody wants to hear what you're saying, but I liked what you were saying with the anti-war statements and the don't look up reference. I have two quick questions. How would you respond to the criticism of somebody who said that you're just using your Harvard degree weight to control the UAP narrative? Specifically, not everybody agrees with Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and Arrow and doesn't think that he has a good faith assessment of the of the information. I know you, that you've worked with him to, in some capacity. And real quick, the second question, Art Bell, one of our loved, loved uh, people that used to be on here, mentioned that scientists' ego and career are so wrapped up in this topic that maybe the scientists might be more upset than the religious with the ET re- re- revelations and with the Brookings report. Did you have any thoughts on that? Right. So first about uh, Sean Kirkpatrick, you know, he uh, just came to visit me at my home. I he, I didn't go to Washington, D.C. He came to my home and met with me and uh, suggested that uh, we write something together, this paper that uh, we wrote. Um, and uh, I did it, but I, I'm not a government employee. I have no relationship to government. Uh, all the interactions I had were uh, a result of the government uh, interested in, in what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm not here to defend anything uh, done by government. I, I, I can just say that so far they have been uh, supportive of what the Galileo Project is doing, and uh, in particular the expedition. We had the U.S. Space Command uh, write this uh, letter to NASA saying that this object was interstellar. Uh, I'm not into politics and or into anything that uh, relates to to national security. I'm just trying to figure out if we are being visited by a technological civilization that sends some gadgets to our uh, neighborhood. That's all. And, uh, you know, that's complementary to what the government is doing. Um, They want to understand most of the objects, whether they come from adversaries, uh, adversarial countries, um, and uh, for me, that's boring, okay? So um, they might have something that is of interest to me. I might have something that is of interest to them, but we complement each other. They are not a scientific organization. So so I would say that at the moment, you know, we get no funding from government. We have no relationship um, with government. So that's uh, the way we operate. Um, and then uh, to your second uh, question, uh, you know, you should think of me like a curious uh, boy. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm just driven by curiosity. Uh, whatever I find uh, will be known. And uh, uh, 
you know, so I, I have no psychological barriers as to what I might find. You know, it's not as if I'm uh, worried about my status, my ego, or anything. I, I just want to figure out what's out there and uh, doing my best to do to get it at it. The problem is many people do have those barriers. So uh, either they are attached to their ego, so uh, you know they will never. Uh, they will try to push back against new knowledge. They would say, well, we pretty much know that everything in the sky is stones. Everything is rocks. And I call that the, the stone age of science, where everything in the sky is stones. And uh-huh. many, many of the rock experts, you know, people that worked on meteors, are, keep arguing against me and saying, oh, this meteor must have been a stone. The, the government data was wrong. Uh, there was a paper about it just two months ago saying that. And it was published in the Astrophysical Journal. And it just shows you, you know, how uh, non-scientific, I mean, how opinionated scientists can be uh, in the sense of saying the data must be wrong because otherwise we cannot fit it with the model for stones. And I say, well, why don't you revise your model? Because I believe the U.S. Space Command, you know, the, uh, they went back to the data. That's, and, in fact, we went there. And we found some materials that they are from outside the solar system. So, you know, this is the, the battle that I'm facing. That, and, and then some of these people call me names and say I'm not doing it scientifically. I'm, I'm deviating from the scientific method when I'm actually collecting materials, studying them, and posting the results. That's the scientific method. So in terms of who is not scientific, I would point to them because they have an opinion, and they don't want to uh, doubt their opinion based on evidence. They want to doubt the evidence. And so the issue of scientists, you know, they are just like human beings, okay? Uh, and like anyone else, they have their own ego. They have um, honors and awards that they, they want, they are running after. And that uh, biases the way they, they look at it. And I'm trying to behave like the kid in the room. I, I don't mm-hmm. want to behave like the adults in the room because the adults very often, you know, are trapped by these psychological things. And I, I, if I see something, you know, like if I see the emperor has no clothes, then I would say it. Uh, and they would say, no, the emperor has clothes and they're invisible. Like Oumuamua has a cometary tail, but it's invisible. That's what they said in many papers. It's a hydrogen iceberg, nitrogen iceberg. And I say, no, we don't see a cometary tail. It's not a comet. I'm just doing it in the most, uh, how should I say, naive way. And then um, let the chips fall where, where they may. And uh, the more data we get, the clearer the picture will get. So it's a, you know, it's a very difficult uh, uh, challenge for me to stay that, that way because of uh, what you mentioned about people attached to their ego and past knowledge but i think eventually we'll prevail just like you know galileo had to be in house arrest but eventually the results uh, were confirmed by others and indeed the earth moves around the sun i mean who cares what people say objects are out there whatever they are will not change by how many likes on twitter or X, <laughs> uh, these ideas get <laughs> You know, in some ways, uh, Dr. Loeb, I'm kind of sympathetic to the Pentagon in that, you know, they gather a lot of data. They have sensors, they have satellites, they have a worldwide presence. So, of course, they collect a lot of information that would be relevant to what you're trying to learn. Uh, I know a lot of it is sensitive because of the platforms on which it's gathered. Seems like there should be a happy medium where somebody like Tim Gallaudet, a former admiral who works with the Galileo Project, could get a clearance to go ahead and go through. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. 